they only very we got only Sahil, Rebecca, and Derek. That's it. Okay. All right, so let's get started. So uh, as you all know that uh, the midterm uh, is already posted, so it's take home during a week and you, you work on your own, no, no help from other students or anybody else. Uh, it's open book, so you can consult textbook or the lecture notes and videos uh, from the class, but uh, you really should not consult anybody outside the class. I mean, the, uh, uh, the uh, other than yourself and instructor and GSI. And I just posted the honor pledge. Uh, so please actually assign it and post it, like what do you do for the homework? And uh, uh, hopefully by 5 p.m. today, the main point is that you sign it before you start the exam. So uh, even if it's not by 5 p.m., that's fine, but I hope you can you will do it just right away, okay? And uh, this is the honor pledge. So uh, you can read it on your own. And then the, at the bottom of this uh, the honor pledge form, uh, there's a place you can actually sign and date it and then, then submit it on the uh, uh, B courses. And ideally you print it out, sign it by hand, uh, scan it and upload it. But if you don't have any access to a printer where you are, wherever you are, then uh, sign it electronically is also fine. So uh, just make sure that you do it. And, and to make sure that you do it, I actually assigned even 10 points to the pledge form. So uh, uh, that counted towards the 200 points of midterm exam. So I hope everything is clear about this. Any questions about that? Maybe on the conditions uh, I jotted down over here. Everything clear? Okay, so let's get to physics. So I started talking about this idea called spontaneous symmetry breaking, which actually turns out to be a common theme for many of the things we talked about so far, uh, bose einstein condensate, superfluid, superconductivity, and, and there are even many other examples I'd like to mention today. So this is actually a very fundamental concept which appears in many different areas in physics, and even, even also in biology and chemistry, I'm gonna to actually to touch on that later. So I'd like to actually wrap up all the discussions we had so far with this concept of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So the symmetry, of course, is very important in physics and it goes going back to Emmy Noether. And she told us that the, any symmetry of the system leads to a conservation law. For example, translational invariance of a system leads to the conservation of the total momentum. A time translation invariance is what leads to the conservation of energy. Uh, rotational symmetry leads to uh, angular momentum conservation and so on and so forth. And what is probably less uh, familiar to you is the fact that once you have a conserved charge, like momentum, uh, energy and angular momentum and so on, these charges actually generate the symmetry. And I make it clear what I mean by generating the symmetry in a moment. So uh, you all know this theorem. And the, uh, so the point here is that once you have a symmetry, then any, any quantum systems, you have a Hilbert space and symmetry has to act on that uh, Hilbert space. And the symmetry is given always in terms of a unitary operator. And the reason being that symmetry has to preserve the probability. And in order to preserve probability, the, you have a state, unitary operator acts on it, and take the absolute square of that state. And that needs to be the same as what used to be. And therefore, the operator of the symmetry has to be unitary. And some of you mentioned that anti-unitary operator is also a possible symmetry, which is the case of the time reverse, reversal symmetry. So it has to be either unitary or anti-unitary. But anyway, you always have this kind of operator that acts on the Hilbert space. So in the case of translation symmetry, I mentioned earlier, there is the conserved charge, which is the total momentum of the system. And the idea of what I said as a generating a symmetry is that once you have this conserved quantity, namely momentum, you put that in an exponent, and this is the unitary operator of the symmetry of translation. So P is a Hermitian operator. So if you put a Hermitian operator and the exponent together with I on it, then this by definition is a unitary operator because the Hermitian conjugate of that is e to the minus I, I times it turns into minus I. P is Hermitian, so it doesn't change. A is a real parameter, it doesn't change. So U turns into e to the minus IPA, which is definitely the inverse of U. Therefore, U dagger U is one, which means U is a unitary operator. In the same way, 
if we have a rotation symmetry of rotating the vector X by a rotation matrix R, correspondingly, you have a conservation law of the angular momentum of the system. So in the same way as we have discussed with translation, if you put the angular momentum operator into the exponent, together with the parameter, in this case, the angle of the rotation, together with I in the exponent, this is again a unitary operator because the angular momentum is a Hermitian operator. And so this is the way angular momentum operator now generates the rotation. So that's the meaning of the word generate. And that, that's the word now that is used in, in mathematical literature, namely that if you have a Hermitian operator, which describes actually infinitesimal version of translation and rotation, because if the amount of translation you do A is small, you can always expand this unitary operator in a power series in this small uh, translation parameter, namely one plus IPA plus higher orders. So the P Hermitian operator is actually what corresponds to the infinitesimal rotation and the, the translation, I'm sorry. And the finite translation turns out to be exponentiation of that. So that's the meaning of the word generating a symmetry, namely that the conserved quantity in this case uh, corresponds to the infinitesimal version of the symmetry. And by exponentiating it, you get a finite uh, 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 action of symmetry. So a less familiar example is probably this one, the changing the phase of the field, which we talked about a couple of times in the context of superfluidity, Bose-Einstein condensate and superconductivity. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the symmetry associated with this uh, change of the phase would lead to the conservation law of the number of the particles. And we did talk about that. So number operator is psi dagger psi integrated over the entire space. It turns out that if you actually put that in exponent, then this is actually the unitary operator of changing the phase of the field. So this idea is the same. Once you have a symmetry, you find a conservation law and conserved quantity can be exponentiated to give you the finite symmetry transformation acting on the Hilbert space in the quantum system. And one sort of a odd uh, uh, a ball here is that some symmetries are what is called discrete symmetries. For example, if you do a, a mirror image of the system, namely interchanging one of the spatial coordinates, but leaving the others unchanged. So X goes to minus X, but Y and X, Z don't change. That kind of symmetry is also a unitary operator on acting on a Hilbert space. But in this case, if you do it twice, P squared, that needs to become one which means the P is inverse of itself. And U inverse was supposed to be P dagger, right? So because a unitary operator. So then P and P dagger have to be the same, namely that P is Hermitian. So P is not only unitary, but also Hermitian. So that it's, it's squared, that turns out to give you one. So in this case, there is no infinitesimal version of it. You either do it or not do it, there's no way of doing a parity a little bit. So uh, in this case, you're talking about what is called discrete symmetries compared to the other example I mentioned earlier, they correspond to continuous symmetries. In a case of continuous symmetries, you can do it just a tiny bit. Namely, you can talk about infinitesimal operator and therefore conservation laws correspond to what appear is in the exponent. But in the case of the discrete transformation, you do it or not. So it's an either or proposition here. There's no way to do it just a little bit. So there's no infinitesimal version of it. So this operator P itself, symmetry operator itself is what is conserved. And, and therefore you can classify all the states in a Hilbert space as a, uh, 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 the eigenstates of this uh, uh, parity operator with eigenvalue either plus one or minus one to make sure that square of the eigenvalue is always one. So there are two classes of symmetries one can talk about. One class is continuous symmetry. Another class is discrete symmetry. And the way the operators transform, not the states, but operators transform, is using this sort of sandwich uh, of the, uh, the operator with this unitary operator of the symmetry operation. So in the case of spatial translation, you have field operator psi of x, 
then you use this operator e to the IPA, which is actually operator of the symmetry itself for the finite translation. So the way the operators change under the symmetry is by sandwiching itself between u and u inverse. And if you do so, you can show that this psi of x turns into psi of x plus a. And so as a part of the midterm problem, you actually write out the, uh, uh, the momentum operator explicitly in the case of the Schrodinger field theory. And then you can work this out to show that in E that actually gives you this finite translation. The way you do it is by using this formula, which I believe you have seen in quantum mechanics class. If you have an operator B sandwiched between exponential form of the operator with the exponent being A, then you can write this out in power series in A, starting with B, and then single commutator, double the commutator, triple commutator, and so on and so forth. So this actually sums up into the Taylor series. And you can easily imagine that uh, this uh, the psi of x with the commutation or the momentum operator turns into just a derivative of psi. So this starts with psi itself. Here's the derivative of psi, here's second derivative of psi, third derivative of psi, and so on and so forth. And then of course, that is indeed the Taylor series uh, that corresponds to the finite, uh, the translation in possession expanded in A for each power in the uh, derivatives. So that's the way you can really check that uh, the symmetry operators are conserved. You verify that with the euler Lagrange equation. And then using that conserved operator, you can really generate the finite translation symmetry or finite phase rotation symmetry using the operators you have in your field theory. So that's the way the Neuter's theorem becomes complete. Namely that once you have a symmetry in the Schrodinger field theory, you can verify that the certain quantity is indeed conserved. Then using that conserved quantity and put that into exponent, you can verify that this sandwich form is really what gives you the symmetry transformation. And so the Neuter's theorem goes in this full circle. So that's the idea of the problem uh, you see in the midterm uh, exam. Okay, any questions about this? How many of you are you here today? Uh, nine of you, okay. So it's not uh, much fewer than normal. So I guess that that's okay. Uh, any questions? Is it okay? Um, could you, I guess, I guess I just wanted to confirm. So you mentioned like the central or like the main idea about the mm -hmm. theorem and mm -hmm. the, like the, I guess duality. So basically just summarize, um, I'm just making sure if I got this right. Um, if we have a symmetry, then we have some conserved quantity. Mm -hmm. um, so on this one, we have say, the momentum p, um, the angular momentum j, the number n. And right. if we exponentiate it, that mm -hmm. conserved quantity, then mm -hmm. we get a unitary operator that generates these particular symmetry transformations. That's correct. Okay. That's the idea. And you will see this in action in the midterm problem. So I hope that everything makes sense after actually doing the problem set. Right? Any further questions on this? Good. So the, the idea of this spontaneous symmetry breaking is something you have seen before already, even though we didn't use this language. So the idea is this. So if we have a potential like this, we have seen this potential for the Schrodinger field when we talk about Bose-Einstein condensate, superfluid, superconductivity. So you actually bring your field, but sitting at the origin is clearly unstable. So the field acquires a value in the ground state of the system. And this, uh, once the field acquires a value, this potential itself has a rotational symmetry. So it doesn't change if you make an arbitrary rotation around the z-axis. But once the field chooses a particular value, this value does not respect the original axial rotational symmetry. So if you do a symmetry transformation, field that lives here would turn into another value of the field, which may be over here. So your ground state changes from one to another. In other words, there are actually multiple ground states. So in this case, there's actually an infinite number of ground states parameterized by the phase of the value of the field. 
So in this case, ground state zero. So in this case, this is not a vacuum state as we talked about because ground state is actually a coherent state, but I'm using the same symbol here. Hopefully it doesn't cause any confusion. So the ground state is not invariant under this axial rotation, which was supposed to be the symmetry of the system originally. So your Lagrangian or Hamiltonian has this symmetry because every term in the Lagrangian Hamiltonian has the same number of psi and psi dagger, if you remember it. And therefore changing the phase of psi does not change Lagrangian Hamiltonian. And therefore that's a symmetry of the system. But your ground state chooses a particular phase of the field operator. And therefore it does not respect the symmetry uh, of the Lagrangian. So in that kind of situation, we say the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So the word spontaneously in this case means that your ground state could have chosen any phase as it likes, and, but it ends up choosing one particular phase. And that is the meaning of the word spontaneous. Symmetry is not explicitly broken because the Lagrangian respects it. Hamiltonian respects it. Symmetry is still there but the ground state doesn't respect it. And so that's this kind of strange situation where a symmetry is, as I said, spontaneously broken. So I will go through uh, some example of this using a, uh, a colloquium talk I have given at, at the various places. And I actually encourage you to watch it. That's available online in video, uh, but I would like to go through various examples uh, as, as I go on. But this is the concept of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So. Are there any questions at this stage? Of course, after seeing more examples, it makes sense much better. But uh, if you have a question at this stage, please do ask. So, uh, so can the ground state just not be degenerate over all possible phases and therefore it, respect the symmetry? Uh, your ground state is degenerate. Is that what you said? Um, yeah, so like, since we have like multiple possible ground states mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and they all could have different phase, Right. How is it that there can only be like one such ground state that we pick with a particular phase that breaks That's the symmetry? That's right. That's right. So, so the, all the ground states which appear at the bottom of this potential have the same energies and therefore degenerate because the symmetry transformation commutes with the Hamiltonian. So if you take one ground state here, and if you act this unitary transformation, your uh, ground state goes from here to there. But because the unitary transformation is a symmetry of the Hamiltonian, it commutes with the Hamiltonian. So the energy does not change between this ground state and that ground state, and therefore they, they are degenerate. And, and you've seen an example for the discrete symmetry, then you have actually discrete choices of ground states, so you can count them up, and then they are degenerate as well. So once you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking, you have multiple degenerate ground states, but the system chooses a ground state out of the multiple ground states, and therefore uh, the, uh, your ground state does not respect the symmetry. So that's the general idea. Is that okay, Sahil? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let me move on because I, I, I hope this idea makes much better sense as, as you see uh, examples of it. <clears throat> so when you have this spontaneous symmetry breaking, we talk about something called order parameter. And I realized I made a mistake with the font over here. So this curly O is meant to be an, an order parameter, which is an operator in your quantum system. And U again is a symmetry transformation. And so when U O U inverse is not the same as O, that means the symmetry transformation changes this operator O. So if you talk about, for example, the uh, direction of the spin of the system, then rotation would change the spins of the system pointing in the other directions. And the question is whether such an operator has an expectation value in the ground state. And when we talk about a magnet later on, you have these electron spins in the system. And if they all line up in the same direction, then that is a ground state of the system. But the spin operator changes under the symmetry transformation, namely the rotation of the system. So if the spins have expectation value in the system, then that is the situation where order parameter has an expectation value in the ground state. 
And remembering that O is different from U O U inverse. So if this expectation value is finite, that is a sign that the, the ground state is not invariant under this unitary transformation. Because if you do the unitary transformation, this order parameter changes from one direction to another. And therefore this expectation value changes, which means that the ground state also changes and therefore ground state does not respect the symmetry. So we use this order parameter as a way of mathematical expression to see whether symmetry is spontaneously broken or not. So when you see a finite expectation value of whatever order parameter, you can define your system. And that's a sign that the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So I mentioned this already in the case of a magnet, in particular ferromagnet, individual spin of the electrons all line up in the same direction. So if you define an operator, which is a total, total spin of the electrons in the entire system, because they are lined up in the same direction, there is an overall expectation value of that total spin operator. And this is an example of the order parameter. When you change the direction, namely do a rotation of the system, then this operator SZ changes. And that's the first requirement over here. The operator changes by the symmetry transformation. But now that this operator has an expectation value in the ground state, then that is a sign that ground state doesn't respect symmetry anymore. Ground state knows the spins are lined up in one particular direction. And there is a separate ground state where the spins are lined up in different direction. So that's an example of the spontaneous symmetry breaking. And whenever you have this order parameter that shows the spontaneous symmetry breaking, then you expect that there is a phase transition. For example, in the case of the spin system, like a ferromagnet, if you go to high temperatures, which is called the Curie temperature, then above that temperature, there is no net magnetization, namely that the order parameter has zero expectation value. But if you start to cool the system, the vertical axis is the order parameter. It stays zero all the way down to the point when you hit this Curie temperature. Then at this temperature, the magnetization starts to turn on and eventually become a saturated value at the zero temperature. And that represents the ground state of the system. So at this point, you say there is a phase transition. And the Curie temperature is the, uh, according to the name Mr. Curie. And that's actually, uh, he's the husband of Marie Curie. So uh, name Curie shows up, but it's not Marie Curie, it's a Pierre Curie. But anyway, so this is called the Curie temperature according to him. And in the case of magnetization, you're talking about this expectation value of the overall spin operator. But you see the similar behavior when you actually look at the expectation value of the field operator, which we discussed in a context of Bose-Einstein condensate, superfluid superconductivity. And again, it's the same behavior. So expectation value of the field is zero down to a critical temperature, but then it turns on at the critical temperature and becomes a finite value below the critical temperature. And for this behavior, you say that this is the second order phase transition. And the re reason for this name second order phase transition is that the order parameter is continuous as a function of temperature or some other parameters like magnetic field, but it's non-differentiable. So if you look at the derivative of the order parameter as a function of temperature in this case, it's zero throughout above the critical temperature, but at the critical temperature, there is a finite derivative. So derivative jumps and it's discontinuous. And the derivative, namely gradient is very large here, but eventually flattens out and goes to zero. So derivative jumps and then decreases from there and eventually goes to zero. So the behavior of the derivative order parameter is zero throughout down to critical temperature, but at the critical temperature, it jumps discontinuously and then approaches zero slowly towards the zero temperature. So then you say this is second order phase transition. 
in some systems, order parameter itself may jump discontinuously. Then you say that is a first order phase transition. So I show you the examples of them on the next slide. But in any case, once you have this order parameter, then existence of order parameter is a signal that symmetry is spontaneously broken. And order parameter would turn on <coughs> at some particular critical values like critical temperature, critical magnetic field, whatever you can control in your, in your laboratory. And then you have the phase transition when the order parameter turns on. So that's a generic behavior of many different systems that have order parameters of this type. Any questions about the general idea here? Again, we will go through more, more examples. So hopefully uh, things start to make sense much better afterwards. Or um, the two? Oh, I, I heard more oh, for people. No, okay, Sahil? Um, so are the two bullet points at the top equivalent ways of expressing the same condition? I'm sorry. Oh, no, this, this first talks about transformation property of the operator. And second statement is about its expectation value. So you first define an operator, which doesn't, uh, is not invariant under symmetry. The, this is covariant. So the operator changes when you do the transformation of the symmetry. And once you have that operator, you ask the question whether that operator has a finite expectation value in the ground state. And so if it does, then this is an order parameter of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So the first one is a transformation property of the operator. Second one is about the nature of the ground state, whether the ground state respects the symmetry or not. Does that make sense? I see. And I just had a general question about symmetry okay. transformation. Mm -hmm. So is it just a transformation under which the Lagrangian is the same? Is that what I guess defines symmetry? That's right. So you okay. commutes with the Lagrangian. Lagrangian is mm -hmm. invariant okay. under it. But O changes under the symmetry. Then we say it's not invariant, but covariant. We talked about this difference okay. between invariance and covariant uh, as uh, before. So if something doesn't change at all, then that's invariant. But it changes, but in a well-defined way, then it's covariant. So we are talking about, for example, spin operator here, which is not invariant under the rotation because it changes the direction. But the, the way it changes is well-defined just by a matrix multiplication of the three by three orthogonal rotation, right? So then you say the spin operator is covariant. And if an operator that is covariant has an expectation value in the ground state, that is the signal that the symmetry of rotation in this case is spontaneously broken. Does that answer your question? I see. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Anna? Uh, yeah, I just had a question about uh, the last bullet point mm -hmm. of like this one the BEC what, stuff? yeah like what basis those ground states are in like yeah, know, so in, naively i would expect it to be zero just right. because but. that's right but the, as you have seen in the case of the cold atom bosonian condensate the ground state was a coherent state and the uh, the field operator is an annihilation operator. Yeah. So yeah. so it has an eigenvalue actually, and doesn't vanish, right? So that's the situation where this field operator has a finite expectation value. On the other hand, as I talked about on the previous slide, field operator changes its phase, uh, generated by the number operator. So this field operator is covariant because if you stick in Psi here, and U is this e to the i n theta operator, then Psi turns into e to the i theta times Psi, which is not the same as Psi, and therefore the field operator is covariant, not invariant. And now that this covariant field operator has an expectation value, that is a sign that your ground state doesn't respect the symmetry generated by the number operator. And that's a situation we talked about, namely that the ground state is no longer the number eigenstate. And as a result, there is a coherence due to the number phase uncertainty relationship. So your ground state 
is not invariant under the number symmetry anymore. And hence the symmetry is spontaneously broken. And, and I realized that this situation of changing the phase of field is not as sort of a, uh, intuitive compared to the rotation of the spin operators, but mathematically it's the same structure. And I hope you can see this, namely that in this case, spin operator is covariant because it changes under rotation. And once it has an expectation value in the ground state, that is a sign that ground state has all the spins lined up in one particular direction. And therefore it's not invariant under the symmetry and hence a rotation symmetry is spontaneously broken. In the same way, field operator psi is covariant under the phase change. And now that it has an expectation value in the ground state, once you have a BEC, then that is a sign that your ground state is not invariant under the, the, the unitary operator of the phase change. So the, mathematically, they are identical, even though I realize intuitively, this makes sort of less sense compared to the spin operator. But I hope you see this analogy between two cases. Yeah, yeah, okay. thanks. Good. Any further questions here? I, I, I thought there was a third voice. No? Uh, I wish to ask a question that you just like made, like, um, and is there like any physical interpretation of the expectation value of psi operator? Yeah. So uh, like, the physical, yeah. the physical meaning is actually what you have done. So once you have an expectation value, then this expectation value would behave as a classical field which you worked out with the Euler-Lagrange equation in the Schrodinger field theory. So the field operator, of course, is an operator, but what follows the classical Euler-Lagrange equation, which describes the superfluid and vortices and so on and so forth, is actually this expectation value of the, the field operator. And that's what actually uh, uh, you use to describe this uh, amazing phenomena of superfluidity and superconductivity. Does that answer your question, Ray? Uh, yeah, kind of. I I actually just we should like visualize this term because ra rather than like having arrows like pointing up and down like this SC operator. Yeah, yeah. So I I show you some pictures kind of like later. Abstract. On. Yeah. Okay. I, sh I show you some pictures cool. later on. Okay. Any further questions? Questions? Okay. And so I mentioned these two different possibilities of uh, uh, the first order and second order phase transition. And the first order phase transition is at the bottom. Some order parameter C changes discontinuously from zero to the finite value with a jump. Then you say the system goes under a first order phase transition. And this is what happens, for example, when you apply a magnetic field to a type one superconductor. So up to some value of the, the magnetic field, then superconductivity persists. And therefore you have this uh, uh, expectation value of this, uh, the Cooper pair, namely that you stick in two powers of the fermion field of the electron. And that has a finite expectation value uh, up to a certain magnetic field. But above a critical field, it jumps to zero and therefore superconductivity disappears and a system goes back to a normal metal, for instance. So that's a situation of a first order phase transition. In this case, the potential for the field, which you have actually looked at uh, in, in pictures many times, should show a discontinuity, namely that at some value of the magnetic field, then the minimum has zero value for the order parameter which is the situation of let's say high magnetic field for the superconductor. But as you lower the magnetic field, the potential changes its form and develops a second minimum. Then your system can jump from zero expectation value to finite expectation value by tunneling through this potential barrier. And below this critical field, then the second minimum turns out to be the lower minimum and the ground state is at the finite value of this order parameter. So once you have a potential that behaves this way, then you can have this jump in the order parameter. 
And this is something you know in other familiar examples. I, I have the, uh, the glass of water over here. Uh, it doesn't show up very well. And then of course you see the ice cube here. An ice cube actually breaks a translation symmetry. And I again show you a picture of this later on, but in the liquid phase of water, then molecules are ziggling around and there's no particular position and the system is translationally invariant. But once water forms this ice cubes, they're crystal, then crystals have this, all the molecules lined up neatly in a particular fashion. And then each molecule occupies a particular position. So the, the system is no longer translationally invariant. You can do a discrete translation by one lattice unit, and then you recover the same a crystal. But infinitesimal translation would take one crystal to another crystal because they occupy different positions. So going from liquid phase to the crystal phase is actually an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking where translational symmetry is now broken in the ground state. And we all know that by going from liquid to uh, the, 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 the solid water, then free energy jumps discontinuously. And that's the reason why even if you cool the wa liquid water down to zero degrees Celsius, you have to keep cooling to suck out finite amount of energy until the liquid water becomes a, a crystal ice cube. And that's because of this jump in free energy called latent heat. So that's an example of the first order phase transition. So cooling water to create crystal ice cubes is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking, it turns out, where you have an order parameter that is discontinuous because you don't have a particular position at the liquid phase. You do have well-defined particular position for each molecule and the solid phase. And there's a jump from no order parameter to a finite order parameter at a zero degree Celsius. And because of this jump in free energy, uh, you have actually latent heat that requires you to uh, uh, keep cooling water uh, to form ice cubes. On the other hand, in the case of this magnet I mentioned on a previous slide, or type two superconductor, then the order parameter turns on continuously, even though it's non-differential at the critical temperature. And that's the behavior you have seen with the potential I have shown you earlier. So if you have potential like this, and it's meant to be rotationally invariant, so you imagine that you actually do a axial rotation uh, away from this plane, then I hope you can imagine that. At the zero temperature, you do have the finite expectation value of the field operator or spin operator. But as you actually heat the system up, at some point, the second derivative at the origin vanishes. So this becomes a quartic function. So this order parameter, which used to be the finite value, would gradually go to zero. And above the critical temperature, then there is a, a finite positive curvature uh, at the origin. So the system gets stuck there. And that's the behavior you get from this curry temp uh, the plot namely the order parameter smoothly goes to zero. And here it's non-differentiable and then stays zero above this temperature. So the difference between second order phase transition and first order phase transition is something you can write down in field theory, quantum field theory, by writing a polynomial function for the potential, which either has these degenerate minima at different values of the parameter, or you smoothly go over from the symmetric potential to spontaneous symmetry breaking potential uh, at the critical temperature or critical field or whatever parameters you have. So that's the way you can describe both types of the, the phase transitions using quantum field theory uh, written in terms of the order parameters. And it turns out that that's exactly what you have done already. I did not explain it that way. But now you see more general context that many different systems can be described in the same fashion. You have quantum field theory for the order parameter field and order parameter has certain potential. And depending on what kind of potential you, can, you, can, you have in your system, you can either have 
second order phase transition or first order phase transition. And, and that's the way you describe a, a phase transition in general for a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And then this kind of theory or description is called the Landau theory of the phase transitions. Okay, let me stop here again. I'll see if, if there are any questions about this. Um, just in general, why do we have that um, the finite expectation value in the ground state uh, means that the symmetry is broken? So that, that is true only when the, or the, what, the whatever the operator that has a finite value in the ground state uh, is covariant under symmetry. So we talked about, for example, spin operator in, under the rotation symmetry. That's covariant because it changes by the symmetry. And it has an expectation value in the ground state of a ferromagnet. And it turns on like this. So it starts out with zero at high temperature and the critical temperature starts to turn on. And that is represented by this kind of potential. Am I answering your question, Sahil? Um, yeah, I guess I'm just not sure of the relation between... Um, so the plot B is the expectation value of the order parameter, mm -hmm. right? That's right. And so how does... I guess I'm just not sure of the particular relation between that and plot A. I guess how the two... How A factors into plot B, essentially. Yeah, so if you recall what we have done with the Bose-Einstein condensate, you have this parameter chemical potential and the expectation mm -hmm. value of the field was square root of chemical potential over the quartic coupling lambda. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. And, and that makes sense when chemical potential is positive, right? So as a function of temperature, imagine that chemical potential starts out with large positive value and starts to decrease and becomes zero at the critical temperature. Then the expectation value of the field operator vanishes at that uh, critical temperature. And above that critical temperature, the chemical potential becomes negative. So it doesn't make sense to write square root of mu over lambda anymore. And that's a situation where the potential energy now has a positive curvature at the origin. And that's what you also have seen before. The potential near the origin was negative mu psi dag of psi plus lambda over two psi dag of psi dag of psi psi. So when chemical potential is positive, you have negative curvature at the origin and therefore leads to finite expectation value. But when the chemical potential is negative, you have a positive curvature at the origin and therefore the expectation value of the field vanishes. And that's precisely the behavior you see over here in this plot B. Oh, Do you I see the see. correspondence? So the, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, I guess the potentials evolve from the bottom most to the top most, and it stays trapped in the ground state. Right. Make That's right. And then you sort of uh, uh, diabetically go from finite expectation value of field to zero expectation value of field, and that's why it behaves continuously, and, but it vanishes identically above the critical temperature, and that's why it becomes non-differentiable at this critical value of the temperature or any other parameters you may have in your system. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Good. Any other questions? Okay. So what I would like to do is basically try to wrap things up uh, for this non-relativistic quantum field theory using a bunch of examples where this idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking actually appears in many, many different systems. And you see more pictures, so hopefully things start to sink in by looking at those pictures. And so this link uh, uh, is actually where you can actually uh, see the slides and video of the colloquium. I did some reorganization. I'm not presenting the whole thing because I don't have time for it, but you get, I just give you a gist of it. And hopefully that gives you a good idea in trying to sort of see the permeating theme among all these different systems under this concept of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And specifically in the case of the particle physics, then the, that concept was introduced by uh, Noyojiro Nambu, who received the Nobel Prize for this concept. So the idea is that system has a certain symmetry called G. And mathematically, it refers to a group of the symmetries, but I don't get into much details here. But the idea is that system has a symmetry, G, but your ground state respect only a subset of the symmetries, H, then you have degenerate ground states, 
uh, in energy described by G divided by H. So that's the general structure of the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And so this up here is really in many, many different systems. So it turns out the lack of laundry is actually a system that ex exhibits spontaneous symmetry breaking. So uh, I, I, I tend to sort of dry laundry by uh, hanging them on a rack without using dryer, you know, that saves carbon production. Uh, so if you do that, uh, let's say I hang the first shirt, then the shirt, I, I, I can just hang it uh, whether the shirt is facing left or right, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, I can just, there's an arbitrary choice. But I have this tendency that when I hang the second shirt, I somehow have the, the sort of a preference of hanging it facing the same direction as my first shirt. And the third one is also facing the same direction, fourth one and so on and so forth. And it really doesn't matter, right? Which way I hang the shirt facing left or right. But at the end of the day, I look at my laundry rack and said, oh my goodness, how come that all the shirts are facing left instead of right? It really doesn't matter which way the shirts face, but somehow the system ends up choosing one ground state where all the shirts are facing left versus another ground state where all the shirts are facing, facing right. So this is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. There is perfect symmetry, namely that I can hang my shirts facing left or right, just as totally arbitrary choice. But at the end of the day, I find myself in a situation that they're all facing left, or maybe they're all facing right. And these are the two degenerate ground state of the system. But the ground state ends up fighting one over the other, and hence the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So in this case, the symmetry we are talking about is indeed parity, namely changing the x-coordinate to negative x-coordinate. Left turns into right. So that's the symmetry we are talking about. And therefore, this is a discrete symmetry I mentioned earlier. But my ground state chooses one orientation over the other. And therefore, the symmetry is spontaneously broken. I hope this makes sense. Any questions about that? And this kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking of the parity symmetry appears a lot in nature. For example, this is halibut, it's the flatfish. And halibut has two eyes on the left-hand side of the body. And uh, they would happen, of course, uh, we can easily guess, you know, they actually try to hide in the sand on the ocean floor to protect them, them themselves from their predators. And in order to lie on the ocean floor, you need to have two eyes on the same side. So under the evolution over many millions of years, they have chosen to put their eyes, both of their eyes on the left-hand side of the body. But it's clear this is an arbitrary choice because there's another kind of flatfish called flounder where two eyes are on the right-hand side of the body. And I know they are different species because I eat both of them. They taste differently. And uh, the Hollywood has a kind of clean taste. It's great for sushi. The flounder has a little earthy smell. So you write to actually simmer in, 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 a, in a sauce for a while, but they are both delicious. But anyway, they are different species. For each species, they ended up having chosen one orientation of your, their eyes on left-hand side of the body or right-hand side of the body. Now they're written into the genes, so they, they get inherited from one generation to the other. So every halibut has two eyes on the left-hand side of the body. Every flounder has the two, uh, two eyes on the right-hand side of the body. But this is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking as well. So in the evolution tree, they have chosen one orientation over the other. Each one is perfectly fine by evidence by the fact that different species end up choosing different orientation. And so it's an arbitrary choice, but they have made a choice. So that's another example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Any questions about that? So the ground state can't necessarily be a superposition over you know, all the possible choices such that symmetry is still preserved and must what? like, you know, collapse a particular choice. That's right. In principle, you're completely right. And in fact, if you have relatively few number of degrees of freedom in a system, then 
you do end up with a ground state that's a linear superposition with all the degenerate ground states. However, once the system becomes macroscopic, then clearly a uh, Halibut is a macroscopic system. Then in some sense, wave function collapses because it can observe itself. And so you choose a particular ground state without a quantum mechanical linear superpositions. So if you see a quantum mechanical superposition of left-handed Halibut and right-handed Halibut, that would be really amazing. But because the system is a microscopic, it ends up choosing a particular ground state and it's no longer a linear position, superposition of the two. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Good. Any further questions here? So another biological system that spontaneous breaks the symmetry, which has chirality, uh, is a conch. So this is a kind of shellfish that winds around in one particular direction over the other. And I once listened to an, an amazing talk by a, a Japanese biologist, Reiko uh, 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 Kuroda, and, and she actually has done the following experiment. So when a, uh, um, uh, the, the fertilized cell uh, starts to divide into eight cells, that's when these cells actually start to wind around in one particular direction for a conch. And so, of course, that's already written in the gene. So every generation of one particular conch species always wind around in one particular direction. The experiment she did is when the cells divide into four and eight and starts to wind around in one, one particular direction, she nudged it and forced it to wind around in the opposite direction. And it turns out the conch is still a fairly simple biological system that if she forced to actually wind around the opposite direction, it actually grew up into a perfectly healthy adult conch with a totally opposite orientation. So it's an evidence that it really doesn't matter which way it winds around. It, it was an arbitrary choice. And you can even uh, uh, make, make the conch take the other arbitrary choice as well by nudging it. But of course it's written into DNA. So even with this wrong orientation conch, once they have their children, their children would wind around in normal direction unless you nudge it again. So this is a demonstration that again, the orientation of this winding, which what she calls chirality of the conch is arbitrary choice. But again, the system has made a particular choice of choosing one ground state over the other. And so that's an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking as well. And that appears also in the sugar. And, and many of you know that the sugar has an optical isomer, namely that a molecule of the sugar has a, a particular orientation between left and right. And what we can consume in a human uh, uh, system is only one particular orientation of sugar and the other orientation we cannot digest it because we have an enzyme in our body that can break down this orientation of sugar but not the other orientation. And from what I learned from looking at internet, so I can't guarantee for the correctness of the statement, but apparently the entire biomass on our planet is the same way. They can consume only one orientation of the sugar, but not the other orientation, which is just a mirror image. So the whole biomass on a planet has made a choice of digesting one particular orientation of sugar, but not the other one. And all the plants, on our, our, on our planet also produce sugar of one particular orientation, but not the other one. And according to what I read on the internet, there are some particular very, very simple single cell bacteria that can apparently consume both sugars of different orientations, but all the other more advanced life forms can consume only one, but not the other one. So that's apparently the case of this orientation of different sugars and we consume this one but not the other one. So if you are clever enough, you can become a billionaire. Uh, this is an opportunity for you because if you have a, some manufacturing process that can produce the wrong orientation of sugar uh, in a mass production, then that will be an incredible thing because we cannot consume it, but taste the same way. It's chemically equivalent. It's totally safe for you with zero calories. So that's a sugar 
kind of natural sugar in the sense that's made of exactly the same thing, but we can consume it and therefore the zero calorie. And that would be, you know, you can see that that would be a, a great sell to many people uh, in the modern world. So that's a money making opportunity for you. So we have made an arbitrary choice of choosing one orientation of the sugar, but not the other one. And that's an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So any questions about that? Okay, I hope this idea started to make sense now. So all of the examples I talked so far can be represented by this potential, x squared minus one squared. And one may have some parameter for the ground state. It may have steepness, that's another parameter. But you know the form of the function is always the same. You have potential energy that's invariant under the inversion of x going to minus x because it's squared. So that's a mirror symmetry with respect to the z-axis. You can flip it and it's still the same. So that's the invariance of your Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. But the ground state has to choose one over the other. It doesn't matter each, uh, either one, but it has, you have to make a choice. And that's exactly what happened with a conch, with a sugar, and the, uh, the halibut, and the, the rack of laundry. So you choose one ground state over the other, and you have an order parameter that's an expectation value and the ground state. And they can be all understood by this simple functional form for the potential energy that forces you to choose one ground state over the other, even though the potential energy itself is invariant under this inversion symmetry. So all the examples that we talked about so far can be described by this single idea that your Hamiltonian or Lagrangian is invariant under a discrete symmetry, in this case, inversion, but the ground state of the system chooses one orientation over the other. And hence, this symmetry of inversion is spontaneously broken. Okay, any questions about this idea? So this is a good place to stop. Does it make sense? Make sense? Okay, Ryan is nodding, so that's a good sign. Good, good. I see thumbs up. So we talked about the spontaneous symmetry breaking of a discrete symmetry so far, but what we have seen a lot already is the spontaneous symmetry breaking of continuous symmetry. So in this case, you have a potential energy, which can be written in a form that's actually invariant under a continuous rotation on X, Y plane. So what we discussed so far is the continuous rotation of the phase of a uh, complex field psi. So if you write psi as x plus i y, then psi dag of psi is x squared plus y squared. So we are talking about the same thing over here. So x and y is therefore real part of the psi and the imaginary part of psi. And once you actually write it this way, it's clear that's invariant under the two dimensional rotation on x, y plane. And therefore you have a continuity of the ground states, degenerate ground states all along this bottom of this potential. And that's an example you have seen already many times in a case of uh, a Schrodinger field theory. So now we are talking about this continuous symmetry. And when Nambu received the Nobel prize, the Nobel committee of course always releases this kind of a, a uh, the, the, uh, description what the Nobel prize was about and, and it has this picture in it. So this is a case of the rotational symmetry. Suppose you have a pencil and just imagine that this pencil is perfectly axially symmetric. And so it actually shouldn't be this hexagonal symmetry, uh, uh, the uh, pencil is, it better be a totally round pencil so they made something wrong here, but anyway, just imagine that this pencil is exactly rotationally invariant. And then the Newton's law of, of mechanics tells you that if you do manage to create an initial condition that this pencil is standing upside down in a perfectly straight vertical fashion, then the equation of motion tells you that it should stay that way, right? And of course, we don't believe that, 
if you actually try to realize this the pencil standing upside down exactly correctly vertically, then of course you make just tiny bit of mistake that is probably tilted just a tiny bit uh, along the one particular direction, then pencil would immediately fall down to this particular orientation. But you know, from the idea of the, the rotational symmetry, in which direction it falls down is totally arbitrary. So you may fall down this way, you may fall down that way, you may fall down this way. So that's again, a choice of the pencil uh, to fall down in one particular orientation over the other. So they use this as an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking, in this case, a rotational symmetry of the system. Uh, any questions about this? And they also use this another example of a rod standing up. And if you apply a force on the rod, then at some point above certain critical force that this rod would buckle. When it buckles, which direction does it buckle to is again an arbitrary choice. And if you just exert enough force downwards and downward force, doesn't have a particular direction. It's a perfectly rotationally invariant way of applying a force. Rod itself is also perfectly rotationally invariant. It doesn't change when you rotate the rod. But once it buckles, it chooses a one particular direction over the other. So again, the rotational symmetry is spontaneously broken. So these are the two examples the Nobel Committee used in their description uh, of, the, uh, of the award, Nobel Prize Award to this idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Does this make sense? Any questions? Okay, so uh, this idea of spontaneous breaking is very, very universal as you already saw in many different examples. And there's a, theorem associated with it, with it called the Goldstone's theorem. So this guy is Jeffrey Goldstone at MIT. And what he showed is the following. So when a continuous symmetry like rotation we talked about is spontaneously broken, then there appear the same number of massless particles or gapless excitations, namely that you have certain mode of excitation whose energy goes to zero in the limit of zero momentum. Uh, so this is kind of mode that's called a gapless excitation in condensed matter physics. In the relativistic case, they correspond to certain particles degree of freedom with no mass, therefore massless particle. And you have same number of such degrees of freedom as the number of broken symmetries. And their energies should go like linearly with the momentum. So that's the theorem proven by Goldstone and later together with the, the um, Abdul Salam and the Steven Weinberg. And this kind of gapless excitation or massless particle is called Nambu Goldstone boson, and obviously according to the names or NGB. And this appears again in many different systems. So suppose you're talking about something frozen, and I don't mean this frozen here, but I mean something frozen from let's say uh, gas phase of uh, molecules of, of uh, water to this crystalline phase of the molecules of water, which is the ice cube I mentioned earlier. And as, as I said already, uh, the gas or liquid phase of water has the perfect translational invariance. But once it crystallizes, then each molecule occupies a particular position. So the translational invariance is broken. And translational symmetry is a continuous symmetry because you can talk about a symmetry by a tiny bit or a little bit further. So it's a continuous symmetry described by a parameter of the distance of the translation. And so according to the Gosselin theorem, you expect a gapless excitation and that's what is called the phonon. So once you have a crystal like this one, then I, I, I couldn't draw a three dimensional crystal. So I'm, I'm replacing with a two dimensional crystal here. Then I have two continuous symmetries of translation in this direction and translation uh, in the, uh, the other direction. And once I push the system with this one translation, then the system starts to vibrate like this. And this is what is called the longitudinal phonon 
And so this is the sound wave classically. And when in quantum field theory, this becomes a, 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 a phonon, that's this quantum version of sound. Uh, and that's why it's a phonon. And energy is indeed proportional to the momentum linearly. Using different rotate, uh, the, the symmetry, that's the rotation this way. And if, if you exert this rotation on the system, and then system starts to vibrate like this, and that is what is called the transverse phonon. And again, energy goes linearly with the momentum. So the theorem holds, namely that the first of all, the crystal is a system that spontaneously breaks the translational symmetry. And for the spontaneous symmetry breaking, you find this gapless excitations as the theorem says. So any questions about this? Uh, is there another like transverse mode? Because he, I suppose you can also like vibrate the the membrane like vertically, right? Then you That's right. So transverse. yeah. So so that that is what indeed what you would see when I, I managed to draw a three dimensional crystal. So that if I use a translation vertically, then system starts to wobble like this. Indeed. That's right. So that would be another transverse phonon mode. But here I discussed only two dimensions. That's why there are only two modes to talk about. Thank you for the question. Any other questions here? Uh, when you talk about like translating, um, you know, under symmetry, uh -huh. uh, are we translating a particular particle at a time or the entire, like say lattice or collection of particles yeah. at a time? So here I'm exerting force of pushing the entire lattice. So I'm using this symmetry to push the entire lattice this way sort of uniformly in X direction, but pushing in Y direction, then that, that's when this system starts to vibrate like this. Oops. Right? And here, again, I'm using the translation in, in X direction, but I exert the force uniformly on all of these uh, lattice points. And that's how the end system starts to vibrate like that. So uh, if you actually push only one particular molecule, it still starts to vibrate, but that would end up being sort of a linear combination of both modes. Does that answer your question, Sahil? Yeah, so the symmetry is broken in the lattice case because mm -hmm. like its location is fixed, so you mm -hmm. can't actually translate it. That's right. And so the action of trying to invoke such as translation mm -hmm. is you know, converted into the scapulous excitation of the right. phonon. That's right. So okay. if you have this lattice, and if you do manage to shift the entire lattice together, then of course that's yet another ground state. So that doesn't require any energy. But if you push on one side, then you are doing translation in some sense locally on one of the boundaries, and then you create an excitation, which is this vibration of the lattice, which is the phonon of the lattice. So that's the idea. If you have a symmetry, of course, if you do symmetry on the entire system together, then you just go from one ground state to another. Like you have this potential and, if, and you go from one ground state to another ground state by doing a rotation. So it's the same idea. But if you do a symmetry transformation locally on one end of the system, and that's the when, case when you produce this excitation of the system, it costs you energy to do so, but in the limit of zero momentum, zero momentum means homogeneous in space, then that go back to the situation of translating the entire system uniformly, and that should not cost you any energy, and therefore energy goes to zero in the homogeneous limit, namely zero momentum limit, and that's how you have this gapless excitation, namely that this excitation of the phonon goes to zero energy when the momentum goes to zero, because that will correspond to the uniform shift of the entire system that does not cost you any energy to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Great. Any further questions? All right. And then you have seen this example of the superfluid helium. So you have this field, Schrodinger field, which changes by a phase under the symmetry, but this symmetry is spontaneously broken in a superfluid because it's a coherent state and the field operator has an expectation value. And that's when you have 
this weird behavior of superfluidity, which you have actually shown in your homework problems. And what's going on here is again, this same potential, the field operator changes its face. In this case, you say this symmetry is U1, U is unitary, but this is a number. So it's a one by one unitary matrix. And therefore you call that U1 symmetry. That's just a mathematical term. And if you're not familiar with this language, that's totally okay. And associated with phase change symmetry of the Lagrangian, you find this conserved quantity, namely the number operator. Again, you verified this using the euler Lagrange equation. And we have this Hamiltonian, which has this potential in it, which we know is invariant under this phase change. So Hamiltonian Lagrangian do have the symmetry, but now that you have this expectation value of the field operator in whatever ground state you pick, this symmetry is not respected by the ground state and therefore symmetry is spontaneously broken. And that's when we discovered that you have superfluid. And we have looked at this excitation spectrum of the system and I didn't emphasize it, but here you see this linear slope of the zero momentum limit of this excitation energy. And again, this is consistent with the general theorem I talked about. In the case of both Einstein condensate, then you could even work out explicitly what the expectation spectrum should be because it's a weakly coupled system, unlike the helium-4, which is much more complicated with the strong interaction and non-local interactions among them. So Bogoblu spectrum is something you worked out yourself and found that this is the linear slope. So this is what it is also called phonon. It's just a name, but it corresponds to, again, the, basically the sound wave of the system. But the reasoning is now different. So this phonon has to do with the change of the phase of the field, unlike the translation invariance in the case of the lattice. We use the same name, but the reasoning is actually different. So it's a little bit confusing but at least the concept itself is the same. We have a continuous symmetry. The continuous symmetry is spontaneously broken. Therefore, for one continuous symmetry that's spontaneously broken, we do have one mode, which is gapless, namely the excitation energy goes to zero when the momentum of the excitation goes to zero. So it's the same idea following the same theorem. Any questions about this? So I, I, as I said, I do realize that this phase symmetry is less intuitive compared to things like translation where you can sort of visualize it, what's going on in a crystal. But at least mathematically, it's, it's exactly the same idea. You have a symmetry of the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian, you have a conserved quantity, but the symmetry is not respected by the ground state of the system because the order parameter has a finite expectation value. And once the symmetry is broken, correspondingly, you'll find a number goes to mode, which is gapless, whose energy excitation goes to zero when the momentum goes to zero. Ryan? Yeah, yeah, uh, I have a question. Like um, you, you just said the expectation value of the size should be the order parameter for this thing. Like, right. Um, like the BC, BC system. So, right. um, so for me, like the ground state should be like the coherent state of this. Uh, this of the zero momentum mode, yeah. Story. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this expectation value should be like the total number of the co total particle number of the coherent state, but- uh, Square root of the, it, yeah, square root of it. Yeah, yes. okay, okay, that doesn't matter. So above the like critical temperature of the transition why mm -hmm. this should become zero because all the parameters should become zero after you cross that that's TC, right. right so all the parameters that, become zero but that's because of lack of coherence it is still a number eigenstate right a number eigenstate changes by annihilation operator to number minus one state so expectation value vanishes if you remember harmonic okay. oscillator, that's the end state. This is an addition operator. This is end state again. So expectation value vanishes. Mm 
even though it has so a finite above, number. Okay, so above like the critical temperature, the ground state should be like an like number eigenstate, but that's right. below that critical temperature, it is a coherent state. That's correct, that's correct. Okay, okay. Yes. And if you see, look at the lecture notes, you see a little bit more details about it using Bogolyubov transformation and all that. And I didn't get into that level of detail in class, but you see a more correct description of it. Okay, any further questions? Good. And in the case of the fermion system, we talked about BCS state. That is also an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking of the phase change of the field operator. It is actually believed that in exploding star called a supernova, and, and certain exploding stars leave a remnant, which is made of neutrons only, called a neutron star. And if you do the X-ray observation of some of the supernova remnant, you see this core, which is actually the uh, supernova, uh, the neutron star. So which is actually the entire star of about the solar mass size, a uh, solar mass kind of uh, 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 mass, is squeezed down to only a few kilometers. So an incredibly dense object, which is basically that the entire star is a single nucleus made of neutrons alone. And description of it, according to a nuclear physicist, is actually a BCS state, which means that the neutron star is also a, 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 a kind of a state with a coherence in it, where the phase change of the field is spontaneously broken. And the superconductor you have also seen, and uh, they, uh, you know, we talked about the fact that the superconductor also has a uh, expectation value of the Cooper pairs, and those Cooper pairs have the condensate, and therefore the number symmetry is broken. In this case, however, the num uh, the, there is no the gapless excitation. It turns out, so if the symmetry that is spontaneously broken is actually a gauge symmetry, which is the case of the electromagnetism then it turns out that you can choose a particular gauge where this mode of the gapless excitation can be eliminated by using gauge transformation. And therefore you actually lose that gapless mode. So the superconductivity has a finite gap, even though it has spontaneous symmetry breaking. And in this case, the reason being that this phase change is actually a function of space and time. And that was the gauge symmetry we talked about that changes the scalar potential and vector potential. So there's a qualitative difference between what is called a global symmetry. That's the phase change of the field operator we talked about in the case of BEC or BCS of the neutrons or helium-3 versus the local uh, symmetry, which is a case of the gauge symmetry. And, and then the Goldstone theorem actually does not apply. Uh, so that is a, something that had been known for already a long time. And so there is a qualitative difference between the global symmetry, where symmetry is done in a space-time independent version, versus the local symmetry, where the symmetry is done in a spontane space-time dependent fashion. And I'm not going to prove this theorem, but this is a fact, and I'm stating the fact, and uh, that's uh, I'd like to actually leave it that way. Any questions about this? Uh, how exactly is the symmetry broken uh, in the superconductor? So uh, we introduce this order parameter of a pair of electron field. And in the case of the momentum mode, there is one electron annihilation operator for momentum P, another electron annihilation operator for momentum minus P, and this pair had this expectation value in a BCS state, if you remember what we talked about. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Any further questions here? Okay, and the rest is, is well, okay, this is just an example of the application of superconductivity maglev. And the, the, uh, one thing I wanted to mention very briefly is that in the, in the superconductivity where you have the symmetry breaking of a gauged symmetry like electromagnetism, we found that the magnetism becomes short ranged by the London penetration depth. It turns out that we are using the exactly same idea in the whole universe today, namely that weak interaction, which is responsible for nuclear beta decay, has a finite range, which is incredibly short, about a thousandth 
of the size of the nucleus, 10 to minus 16 centimeters. In order to understand why this weak interaction is short range, we invoke this idea of that entire universe is basically a piece of superconductor. And there is a particle called the Higgs boson, which is condensed anywhere in the empty space of the universe today after a phase transition. And that is actually causing the short rangeness of the weak interaction in much the same way that the condensate of the Cooper pairs in superconductor is causing the short rangeness of the magnetic field. And that indeed, what had been discovered by Large Hadron Collider. And so we use the same idea between the universe for the weak interaction and magnetism in superconductor. And this is how they discovered the Higgs boson. Namely that by smashing protons and protons, it's basically taking a piece of hammer and whacking on the vacuum. And because Higgs boson anywhere in the vacuum, you just manage to knock it off from the vacuum and that Higgs boson immediately decayed into two photons, which you have detected. And that's how you know that Higgs boson indeed had in be, indeed be created uh, in this experiment. So we are using the same idea between superconductivity uh, in the laboratory and the Higgs boson in the universe. And in the case of superconductivity, that has to do with the magnetism. In the case of Higgs boson, that has to do with the nuclear weak interactions of the beta decay. So let me stop here. And I hope you have some time to watch the rest of the colloquium and to enjoy the uh, other different ideas that come in with this uh, general concept of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, any questions? Uh, this is the end of class today. Okay, then good luck with the midterm exam. And uh, next week we start discussions on relativistic quantum field theory, and we will finally see the photon coming from the classical electromagnetic field after quantizing it. So hopefully I get to fulfill my promise that we will talk about photon starting next week. Okay. Thanks. Good luck. Thanks.